Now, Sam, you've actually written um, on Buddhism, and yeah, you, you yeah. have an essay which I recall called Kill the Buddha. Yeah, because you take the Buddha, you, yeah. <laughs> Although it's, it's you, not you as... Take, it's, it's obviously from that very old, uh, what was it, 12th century monk yeah, or something. Yeah, there's, there's a koan. If but you your, your position book, is, yeah. is that, in fact... Well, why don't you say what your position sure. is? I, I just wanted to first respond to you, Joan, because I, I feel like um, something in my remarks uh, struck you as a caricature both of religion and science, as you said. And uh, I want to dispute that, although... Um, conceding several points to you. One is that the point that, that Richard uh, conceded, which is it may be that there is room for different voices here, and it may be politically necessary to, at various moments, use the language of a community uh, so as to draw them into uh, an actual engagement with, with modernity. Um, but you were saying much more than that. You were basically saying that uh, it is highly doubtful that we can get morality uh, really up on a foundation without believing something religious, without believing that one of our books is not an ordinary book, but may be the word of God or may be the best book ever written, never to be superseded. And I, and I highly doubt that. And I, th I yeah. think the, when, we, when the conversation moves into morality, I, I, I want to try to give you a rational foundation, what I think is a truly rational foundation for morality, um, which is, doesn't partake of any, any uh, superstition. Uh, but the, the thing I want to point out to you is that it seemed to me you were you're pointing out the role of bias in science. You're saying that you can, you, know, you can pick out individual scientists or individual theories or individual moments in science where scientists were just flat wrong and they were wrong based on their own biases. And that is a totally legitimate thing to do. It is a totally scientific thing to do. I mean, you are, bias in science is bad science. Uh, bias in religion is faith, it's doctrine, it's redeeming, it's holy. I mean, we, it, it, you don't have the same corrective mechanism in religion. And j just before you, yeah. uh, I just want to bring in Pat Churchland's piece. Uh, the reason why neuroscientists are queuing up to meet with the Dalai Lama and not with the Pope is that there is a different uh, discursive tradition within Buddhism right. than within Christianity or within, and certainly within Islam. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the Tibetan Buddhism is in its totality a, being practiced as a religion by most Tibetan Buddhists in this world. But the Dalai Lama is a very sophisticated uh, 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 connoisseur of, of uh, modernity, and he's interested in science. And there is an empiricism to Buddhism, which, which makes legitimate the statement that you hear on the lips of many Buddhists that Buddhism is not even a religion. It's a philosophy. It's a, it's a mode of, of it's, a, it's an introspective methodology. Uh, and I hope to say something more about that. But the, but the thing that has to be admitted in the spirit of science is that whatever is discovered by meditation, for instance, is not Buddhist. I mean, we don't, we're, we don't talk about Muslim algebra. We don't talk about Christian physics. And there are good reasons why we don't, because th those are real areas of discourse, and they got, they got lifted out of the, the cultural contingencies where they were discovered. And we will not talk about Buddhist meditation, ultimately, and, and the Dalai Lama is unique among, among religious figures in that he will admit that. No. Yeah, um, but I think those comments are very, very much on point. So, so two things. First, um, I express skepticism that, that we could have an ethics or a morality um, that was um, not derivable from a, a religious or uh, faith tradition. That doesn't mean I'm, and I'm not asserting though that um, that that's necessary. I'm just skeptical because my experience with uh, ethical discussions, uh, which were taking place solely in a rational, rationalist context and without any system of values associated with them, were inconclusive and seemed to me to be very open to manipulation, particularly manipulation for the profit motive and. Uh, uh, things of this sort. So I think it's an open question and for someone who does actually want or envision the um, disappearance of religion uh, in the modernity of the future, then there has to be some really hard work done on how to um, develop a system of values um, without that and I, that's really hard. Secondly, I, I do want to speak to the point of um, 
whether there can be any critical analysis within religious thought. And if I may say, I think you're underestimating the, even within the Roman Catholic tradition, um, the role of critical scholarship. And I'm impressed at how much um, critical analysis there is on, on the subject of gender and sexuality within the uh, Roman Catholic departments of theology. And, and I've personally been attending conferences at Loyola Chicago about this. And I've asked them, how does critical scholarship within theology, which examines the truth of, or the, the, the biblical, biblical accuracy or justifiability of what is currently doctrine from, from the bishops and the clergy, how does, how does theological scholarship get to them? You know, and can't they just do whatever they want as the, the clergy in charge? irrespective of what biblical scholarship is, or theological scholarship is showing. And they've argued that, uh, to me, that it's similar to the reaction, to the interaction between legal scholarship and law. That um, legal scholarship doesn't translate necessarily into law, but at some point, those who have to write laws do have to refer back to the body of scholarship um, in their subject. And so I think it is an indirect connection and I, I wish that the model of the Dalai Lama uh, were more readily available. But on the other hand, I don't think we should assume that, that Christian doctrine or any other religion, religious doctrine is absolutely static and unchangeable. Yeah, well, I'm not making that point, if just for 30 <clears throat> seconds, if I could just okay. say that what, what troubles me, and I know troubles uh, Richard about this, is that religious people tend not to be honest about where those changes are coming from. They're coming from to my mind, the, the hammer blows of modernity that make certain religious doctrines untenable. So, for instance, now the, the, the Pope is rethinking the doctrine about contraception. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe a, a married couple, within the context of a marriage, if one is HIV positive, maybe it's okay to use a condom. Let's say he gives ground on that. Yeah. That will not be a sign of the vibrancy of Christian dialogue getting to the truth of the matter. That will be a sign of a given religious dogma becoming untenable in the face of its, of its practical consequences and in the face of the fact that there's no uh, good reason to have it there in the first place. Um, and so what, I mean, what, what Pat is referencing about the Dalai Lama is quite a bit more seditious than that. I mean, the Dalai Lama has said, if science proves any mm -hmm. principle of Buddhism to be incorrect, science wins. Now, that is a, a much more radical statement coming from the head of a church. And um, I mean, what, what I heard, heard Richard saying, which I fully agree with, is I mean, what if, it's, if these are all just books, you know, it, we have a choice between having a, a 21st century dialogue about ethics and, and, and the nature of reality, or we can, we can fixate ourselves in the, in the first century if we're going to hold to the New Testament, or the seventh century if we're going to hold to the Quran. Uh -huh. And if there's something good in the Bible that is really standing the test of time, which I think there is, I mean, there, it's not much of it, I don't think, but the golden rule, for instance, I think is one of the, the, the most beautiful uh -huh. distillations of our ethical impulses. We can use the golden rule in uh -huh. the 21st century without believing anything preposterous. And we, we can see the wisdom of it, and then we can jettison all the, all the rest that is, that is act that we, we effectively jettison anyway because nobody's reading Leviticus now and saying we should be killing people for working on the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so, an interesting program. So, I mean, we'll see how so, that plays uh, out. Yeah. Could we just... Um, one quick uh, comment from Neil, and then um, Carol and Paul, who I think will take us to the break. <coughs> and I think the, uh, the, the, we'll have a chance later on for doing more about the Dalai Lama. I um, actually who, only had a couple of simple comments, but then you invited me down here, and now I'm all steeped in Buddhist philosophy. <laughs> I was really going to just make a couple of, uh, I wanted to tidy up a couple of loose ends that were dangling. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the fact that uh, you were citing uh, uh, not to generalize, but sort of sexist philosophy's influence on the science that gets done or interpreted for biology, and using that to generalize what's bad about science or what needs to be fixed about science, when in fact that's a frontier of science that is subject to these, the vagaries of funding and of bias. But that's the skin on this growing apple that is science. Science is, is this collection of understandings that works. And if you're only going to look at the frontier of that, of course, it's going to flip back and forth. And so that is not the measure of what science is. The measure of science is, is the body of knowledge and understanding that sits behind us right now. And we're standing on that.
firmly because evidence in experiment <clears throat> and the application of scientific methods has demonstrated that. And so I just want to just make it clear that, and, and reflecting on Sam's point, by the way, it'll, if that proves to be false, those assertions, okay. it'll probably be proved to be false not by a sociologist who declares it's false because it, it doesn't sound good sociologically, but, but because there's evidence that says that it can, it's untenable. But a different point I wanted to make was regarding, the, you made this point about estrogen and, and the, 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 the fluctuations of scientific truth on the frontier. Um, there's, a, there's a term in the equation here that has not been mentioned, and that is the role of the media. Um, while it is true that occasionally a scientist will conduct a press conference, that happened with Stanley Pons and, and Fleischmann for cold fusion. And by the way, no other responsible scientific lab was able to verify those conclusions, and so it was quickly removed from the table of science. But if you look at what medical journalists do, they subscribe to the New England Journal of Medicine, and it lands in their office, and they comb the top pages, and they make news stories on what are scientific results that are just fresh out and un unverified by other groups, unreverified by the same group, perhaps. And so that's part of the equation of the confusion of the public. I'm, I'm agreeing with you that, that we have to be, as a community, sensitive to what the public who hears the scientific result is to think when they see it flipping back and forth. And the media and the scientists who are exposed to the media need to be much more sensitive about reporting the uncertainties of a result or the, the reliability or the repeatability of that result as it comes forth. And so, but to indict an entire industry or community because that's how it comes out on the edges, I think undersells the true value of science to the, to, to, to the world. Yeah, 